Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sustainable Earth 2021. This is day two of our really exciting conference here. Um, my name is Jonathan Bloor, and I am a research fellow on the Low Carbon Devon Project at the University of Plymouth. Um, so we're having a, you know, we're having, we're having a ball here, as they say. This is Marketplace session three, um, room two, and we'll have two guests with me this morning i have uh, mr alistair mcpherson and dr rob schindler thank you and um <laughs> so without further ado we're going to have two two parts of the session um a 15 to 20 minute presentation from alistair and then a q a for five to ten minutes and then we will transition into um the same for rob um, and then maybe we'll all have a discussion at the end. We'll see how, how time goes. So without further ado, um, I'm going to bring on Alistair. Morning, Alistair. Good morning, Johnny. Morning. Nice to see you again. Um, now, Alistair's going to be giving us a presentation on community-led zero-carbon housing um, from the Plymouth Energy community. So uh, good luck and over to you, Alistair. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Alistair McPherson. I'm um, an environmentalist. Um, and the chief executive for Plymouth Energy Community. Um, and I just want to give you a quick run through in terms of the work. Um, work on a community. So just a little overview to, to who are Plymouth Energy Community. Um, we are a charity, a social enterprise with a mission around bringing local people together to tackle fuel poverty and the climate crisis. Um, we do that by increasing ownership um, in um, options and uh, around tackling the climate crisis and local energy solutions. And we support people to, in you know, basic terms, um, keep their homes um, warm and uh, affordable. We're part of a wider um, national wide sort of movement of community energy organizations that are about grassroots local solutions, um, place based solutions for the climate crisis and um, um, and trying to drive um, uh, greater levels of democracy and local involvement in those kind of solutions. So um, that for us means two things locally. We work in two spheres. Um, and we're an organisation now, with, we've been around since 2013, and we're an organisation with about 15 full-time equivalents, about 1.5 million turnover. Uh, we've got um, sort of £500,000 worth of investment from local community investors within us. And that does us, um, allows us to do two things. We, we build and own community-owned assets um, to help the climate crisis. So renewable energy installations is what we're focused to date. And the, the picture on the left is our solar farm at Erna Settle in the northwest of Plymouth. And we provide people with advice around how they can change their behaviours and their properties to be more, uh, one, affordable for those on low incomes and two, those uh, yeah, more um, carbon effective, more energy efficient. Um, so, um, and so we have a team of advisors working in that space. Um, so there's two spheres to our work and I'll be talking largely about um, the, the latter, about owned solutions, particularly in the housing space. We're an impact organisation, so this is why we get out of bed. We, we want to help um, local households um, uh, with, with their challenges around fuel poverty and energy efficiency. And last year we, we supported 3,000. And out of that work, we generate very significant levels of local savings to those households. So £686,000 were saved from those households um, last year. So that's money that can be reinvested back in the local community. And we work often on a very detailed casework basis on a one-to-one -one kind of um, situation with, with households, like working with them maybe over two to three months through a range of issues through, um, at the moment, for instance, we've got programmes supporting um, low-income households to get um, up to £10,000 worth of grant um, to fund um, energy efficiency and um, low-carbon heating and power solutions in their buildings. Um, so we work very closely with households that, that might struggle to get hold of, of these kind of opportunities without um, we work through our um, solar um, installations that are installed on 30 schools through the city and our solar farm. We generate a significant amount of uh, renewable energy. And um, as a small social enterprise and charity, we, we do actually own over 20% of the city's um, renewable energy capacity. 
Um, so you know, we, we are a substantial local um, infrastructure provider in that respect. And that work saves, um, you know, a local the, the, the organisations where we have solar um, power and solar panels on the roofs save significant amounts of money through the reduced um, price that we can sell the solar energy to that. And all that generates savings in carbon, which is what we need to do. So Peck Homes came from an idea that, you know, a community organisation like Peck that had been working in the space around, you know, renewables for some time and uh, you had a track record in bringing forward developments um, and was seeing through its advice work on a day to day basis some of the challenges that uh, you know, people in the poorest quality housing through the city on the lowest incomes were having uh, uh, around, you know, the solutions to housing and the current solutions to housing are not fit for purpose and we wanted to lead the change um, in terms of driving different solutions. New homes will be built in Plymouth uh, over the course of the next um, uh, 10 to 34 we'll see 26,700 new homes and 6,000 of those will need to be affordable homes and if we're going to be zero carbon uh, not 50 percent reduction in co2 um 100 percent reduction in co2 these be, need to be net homes. and the current way of building homes is a long way shy of that the, you know the incumbent methods for home building new home building um are a long way um from being um zero carbon however way you count it it needs to be very sizable change in the way um, an approach to building homes um, and we want to you know see that show how that can be done locally so what we've done is we started established a community land trust called peck homes um, uh, which is there to effectively drive and lead that change um, and we want to give people an opportunity to own this local solution through the way we've raised finance community shares and to have a kind of innovative management model that build build Spirit, future management of those properties. Fundamentally, we want to lead a change, disrupt and prove the art of the possible um, by you know, using our community credentials and saying, right here, this is how you could do it differently. And supporting though, those that want to do this but currently can't because of policies, policy constraints or other kind of business constraints in that space. So we want to drive flagships of local innovation. That's why we want to disrupt and do things in a different way and fundamentally deliver homes that are community owned, warmed, affordable and desirable to live in and net zero energy homes. And we want to do that in a way that isn't a grand design that just like, you know, comes along and talks about in a few time does a decent television program and then asks the question at the end about have you paid off all your debts off your credit card yet um and uh, you know the, the, the interviewees then kind of look a little shy we want to do it in a way that's reputable and affordable it will need some subsidy to get going definitely but we want to do that and it will subsidize a solution that in the course of time through scaling and replication could drive a model that makes this work time and time again utilize an approach that is being used at scale in Holland and increasingly in France and Germany it's called the energy sprung approach and it's approach it's a not a product it's not a particular design solution it's a way about thinking and purchasing homes um, uh, that are net zero energy and so these are properties that have had a kind of net zero retrofit um, and this model I think developed in a retrofit housing retrofit context um, and now is being used increasingly on the content in the new build context it has been used in retrofit in england and there's been exemplars of case studies delivered in um, exeter and north devon there was an award-winning scheme in nottingham first schemes are kind of something to come out of the ground in some essex as well and so what we want to do is utilize the same approach and same thinking in a new build context and build the first uh, in the energy sprung new new build development so we want you know uh, the way we do that is ask we ask the building market for something so we're a developer and when we go out and procure our kind of construction team we're going to ask for something fundamentally different so we will ask up front for a net zero energy house now that doesn't happen very often and then we will ask that builder to, to guarantee that in, in a way that doesn't normally happen that guarantee of performance of that building allows us to raise the extra capital when we borrow the money um, um, 
to to pay for the capital uplift of that extra um, build cost. If you want to build net zero energy homes, we know from you know, Grand Designs always shows if you want to build these really high performing, high quality homes, there will be a capital cost to do that. The issue is how do you fund? Um, what we want to do is utilize a thing called this comfort plan, which effectively takes some of those long term savings from the energy bill um, and like, allows that as an income strand into the housing developer, us Peck Homes, to help us then raise the extra capital from the banks. And this effectively shows um, that approach in a different way. So on the left, we've got this traditional approach where we're building houses using and you know, have these kind of cost components. And then sometime down the line, down the line, in the next 10 to 15 years, we will every house that we are building at the moment at the whatever at the building rigs will need to be retrofit. So there is a retrofit cost to the public purse or somebody there to make that happen. What we're trying to do is bring that net zero energy capital cost into um, this kind of the cost up front and then over time reduce that. It will come down as the industry scales. And that's what we're trying to demonstrate. It will rely on modern methods of construction. So building homes away from the building site to get those really high performance specifications. And so again, you know, there is a, an emergent industry of MMC providers out there. And what we wanna do is go to those MMC providers and get them to specify and um, guarantee the performance in an energy context of these MMC, MMC homes. These are these kind of homes, net zero, new build, uh, energy sprung homes being built and assembled in uh, this site which is in Holland. Um, they've got a, effectively a very high performance fabric. Um, roofs, they've got heat pump and um, MVHR kind of built units into the uh, into the roof, and they're assembled on site in four or five days. Again, these are net zero any homes built in Holland, and um, we want to do something similar here in Plymouth. So again, what is it that's different? Again, we're not saying that it has to, we're, as, as us, as the developer, it must have, um, it must have groundwater uh, heat pump, it must have a solar panel, it must have um, these. What we were saying is what it must do is perform a net zero energy standard over a long term. And you as the housing developer must guarantee us that level of performance. And if not, you, you will have to pay us some money to make it. That is not how homes are normally designed and built at all. Um, these energy kind of elements of most normal housing developments don't get considered until quite a long way down the line. So we're asking for something very different. We're trying to use it on a, you know, it's about a focus on what those want. They want, you know, effectively, you know, within this net zero homes, they want a certain amount of plug load, a certain amount of warm water, a certain amount of temperature built into the guarantee. And we try a kind of um, a market for this. If we just do one project like this, it will always be expensive. So we, we, as part of our kind of disruption role, effectively are seeking to build a wider demand by working with other social landlords um, uh, around how this could happen. And equally working with government and government advisors, people at Homes England to, to, to prove and to demonstrate that this could do. So what does that mean in Plymouth? So we have a site, so we're working very closely with Plymouth City Council. This site is at uh, in the northwest of the city. Um, this is it from an oblique area looking west. Um, we've got Marine Academy in the back and there we, sh we, we own um, a significant solar installation on the roof of, and actually at the, at the back in northwest, you can see our solar farm at Ernest Hill. So the site's been allocated for housing and we're working um, with um, uh, Plymouth City Council to bring that forward to bring energy development. City Council is promoting this as a flagship climate emergency scheme as part of its plan for homes. Um, so a strong partnership there. This is um, a master plan. So we have a planning application currently in um, with the Plymouth City Council's planning department to, to bring this site forward in two phases. Um, so we're looking at um, 70 homes with a mix of one bed, two bed, um, three bed homes and um, some four bed homes. 
developed over two phases um, with um, the whole master plan and thinking starting from that premise about how do we in, in build within this space homes that can be net zero energy? What will be the requirements of that space in that? And some of that thinking is making sure that we can attract the MMC providers and will need a different way of like come in and access the site. So having flat development platforms, which their units can be brought onto in a modulus context is important. So some of that thinking has filtered through from, from the outset. But it's not just about energy, it is about wider sustainability. Those are kind of values that we can, you know, can cut, you know, cut us and they run through us quite deep. And um, so uh, this will we'll be aiming for um, a, a net, net biodiversity gain within the site. We are, we're looking at um, significant kind of um, improved access to the local green space. We're looking at um, EV charging and a pool a, a AV club within the site so that you know future residents of it of this site will be able to access um, uh, um, shared either bikes or cars and it will be coming forward as a hundred percent affordable housing scheme so we need to be building more affordable houses houses over seven thousand more affordable homes need to be built in Plymouth 10 years um, and we need those to be net zero so this is a stab at doing that in a way that we think can be replicated in multiple sites across the city. So that's our master plan. And the it's quite a steep site, and this is kind of some um, you know, it's not an easy site. So if we can do it here, it's definitely easy on a flat greenfield site. So um, yeah, so we have some challenges um, to work through in respect to that, but it is doable. Um, and given its location, it will provide an amazing place to live in the future. So this isn't sort of this sort of dark and dirty kind of housing state kind of tucked in some kind of non-attractive location. This will command fantastic views across um, the estuary and across um, that bit of Plymouth. So a bit of a call to action at the end, really. So uh, if you'd like to get involved um, and um, know more, please go to our website um, there. There's, there's more detail about PEC Homes and about the site and the background to us. Um, please email us at support at Plymouth Energy Community if you would like to get involved in some form. You can, there's different ways of supporting and getting involved um, in us. We are a community-led organisation with community membership at our heart. And crucially, um, really be keen if there were people that wish to support this kind of initiative within Plymouth to go to our planning application at that kind of hyperlink there and express your support. Have a look at the plans and you know, put down you know, some, some markers that Plymouth needs these kind of things. The climate <laughs> and our planet needs these kinds of developments and that you would like the planning committee to approve it. So that's it from me. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Alistair. That was uh, fascinating and a, a great new project um, coming out of um, Plymouth Energy Community, Plymouth Energy Home, um, Plymouth Homes, which is just, you know, uh, fantastic. So I'm really, uh, yeah, I mean, interested in in the kind of hurdles that you've been, you know, that you've had to overcome, especially at this um, Coombs Way site at King Tamerton. Apart from the geography, what would you say was the biggest kind of hurdle? To sort of getting this sort of project off the ground really well for, for us you know as a, as a small aspirant community-led organization money um so mm. you know we, we need to find some backers so we've been support, supported to date with um some money from homes england that are supportive community-led housing schemes like this but also from power to change um and we kind of support this kind of work and groundwork so there is a kind of there's a support network for us but we need to access that um and grab that's got us so far through the planning process we've also used that money to to make this pitch around innovation and so we got some backing from innovate uk to kind of also Great. in practice what does this mean you know to effectively mm -hmm. procure homes at scale in this way it's quite mm -hmm. a different art and mm -hmm. is is the supply chain, for instance, in the right place to, to mm -hmm. be able to respond to us? There's no point in us asking for a product or a service that nobody can supply. So working through that has has been a challenge. Um, right. and, but we've been resourced and supported by you know various different players to do that. So that's that's been really helpful. Uh, I mean, we're now in a place where we're just about to launch that procurement and confident that there are a number of providers that want to uh, work with us. 
but we're also mm. in a place where you know, the government agencies like Home is England are really interested in what we're trying to do. Mm. They like the credentials that we show, um, and they like, as a smaller organisation, a smaller aspirant housing association, we can do stuff that some of the large, mm. you know, um, we don't have the targets and drivers that they do for, for straight affordable homes. We're there very much focused on this net zero piece. Mm, yeah, putting the capital cost of, uh, of, of a net zero build in, into the initial cost of the house is a is, is a no-brainer in some ways. I like the way that you know, you're know you working with that model. We've got a question here from Mark McPhee. He says, uh, hi, are you using the passive house standard to guarantee the low energy use? Well, I suspect that. Yeah model in Europe is based on that, but go on. Learning from passive house standard that it can filter into what this, but what we're not doing is saying we want a passive house. What we want is a house that meets net zero energy specification, which is looser in, in, mm -hmm. in the way it allows the solution provider, the builder, to, to get to it. So mm. it is very likely that many of the elements of Passive House will filter through it. And some of the, the assessment tools that Passive House use um, for it will be helpful in our design. What we're not saying is every product has to meet the Passive House standard. The whole design doesn't have to meet the Passive House standard. So the, we, Passive House is, is brilliant, but there's a reason why it hasn't scaled. Yeah. And some of that is because it is very, very, very specific. Mm -hmm. um, and what Energy Sprong has done in Holland is listen a little bit to the supply chain about where they need to have ability to bring products together to bring a net zero energy house. And so mm -hmm. it provides some greater wiggle room in some respects than passive house. But in many respects, it's still going to be that these houses will be very airtight, high energy performance fabric with stuff like PV and heat pumps in it. M many of the things that you would see on a, on a normal passive house as well. We're just not holding to that standard from the outset. No, no, that sounds, um, sounds like a pragmatic approach. And well, I think that's, we're coming to the end of our time this morning with you, Alistair. Um, it's been a really interesting presentation. So thank you for coming. Thank you for presenting. And if anyone wants to discuss this topic further, there's a discussion board open under this um, subject. So that, you know, please move on to that now and um, continue the conversation. But yeah, I'd like to thank you again and uh, look forward to seeing these houses and, uh, you know, in their full glory. Thanks a lot, Alistair, cheers. Well, that was a really, really interesting presentation there from Alistair McPherson. Um, yeah, it's nice to know that the, you know, that you can get some sort of house built that's not you know even though it's going to be carbon neutral in some way that it's it's the aesthetics are being thought about you know and that's really important for people um you know as we live our daily lives well this morning now we've got our second guest on this marketplace session uh dr rob schindler um i'd like to welcome him to the stage good morning rob morning i don't think i can hear you but um, i'm sure that sally can fix that backstage now dr um dr rob schindler he's from the university of plymouth um and uh he's going to be doing a presentation this morning called sticky stuff which i which i think may lure some of some uh, some participants in it's an interesting title but the you know the subtitle is using biopolymers to sustainably protect our coastal infrastructure from erosion which is a, you know a fascinating topic um are you there rob can you hear me <laughs> you can hear me but i can't hear you so sally are we all good to go ah i think alice you might have to stop sharing just to just to give um give rob a bit of space there um so yeah i mean it really until I can hear you, Rob, I'm going to keep talking because you know that's my. Uh, <laughs> what do you reckon? That's the that's the that's the chair's role, surely. But um, I think I'll try and talk on your subject. Not that I know anything about it, but biopolymers. You know, I did a fair bit of research at the University of Plymouth um, using biopolymers. So maybe we'll have some something to talk about afterwards. But I think you know using uh, an ubiquitous natural material to to provide a role um in in stabilizing 
the sort of potential impacts we have on the on the ocean floor is a really really positive idea um and so yeah um I, I kind of i like i like your approach apparently you're muted rob but if you can press anything on your end that'd be really useful um so no hands up <laughs> <laughs> I've got a refresh your page request, but I'm sure that's probably not going to work. So, yes. Oh, there we go. He's dropped off. He's probably going to do a little bit of rebooting, everybody. So please bear with. Um, yeah. So, you know, polysaccharides. I mean, you know, biopolymers. That's what we we're talking about. We're talking about biological sugars that join together in a nice long. Oh. Is that sound I can hear in the background? Rob, are you there? Yeah, I'm live now. Yeah, I refreshed. I don't know oh, I'm now available. So. Brilliant. Well, I was just about to go off in territory that I have, you know, <laughs> very little license. So uh, I'm glad you're here. You probably know more than I do, if I'm honest. Well, <laughs> we all, we'll all get there in the end, I suppose. So, yeah, sticky stuff by Rob Shit. So I just click on the... Uh, there um, we go. We can see you perfectly. That's lovely. Thanks very much. Cheers. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. And I'd just like to applaud Alistair and his efforts. I'm not quite sure who put this presentation together with his, as it's a little bit different. Um, nevertheless, hopefully sustainable. I'm a researcher at Plymouth University. I'm interested in um, sediment transport and flow environment. And naturally, I'm increasingly interested in how uh, sediment transport and erosion um, needs to be arrested, particularly in, in terms of increased uh, hydrodynamic forcing. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the use of the ocean as we develop our blue economy to harness the power of the seas and look a little bit about the um, ways we might be able to harness this a little bit more sustainably. Uh, with H.R. Wallingford, who uh, a consultant. Okay. Next screen, please. Okay, so what is the problem? Well, I'm talking about erosion around structures, erosion and scour. Um, whenever we stick something in a flow, whether it be a, a waves or current environment, we get scour. And this uh, this model here shows a little bit about what happens. So here, here is what could be a bridge pier or a monopile for an old Let the flow generate a great deal of turbulence. You can see these turbulent structures, particularly this horseshoe around the bed. This is a horseshoe vortex, and it focuses well, and amplifies it significantly. It any of the sediment, whether it be sand or mud or gravel. It can liberate that, and it carries that away into the flow. Hole. And clearly, if you have a hole beneath an offshore wind farm or a bridge pier, you have problems. Also, we can find that waste can be focused, particularly around offshore wind farms. There can be different wave pressures and wave reflections, which amplify that force acting on the bed. And by simply disturbing the sediment we are building in, that weakens the ability of the sediment to resist that power acting on the seabed. So what happens is, these are just some uh, quick images. This is an offshore wind farm, and this is a schematic of what's behind it. The middle image is actually some measurements taken at the seabed around the structure. We can see this big conical shape. What happens around a bridge pier? This is a, this is a railway bridge in the usually undermined by erosion. We can see that the original riverbed was actually sort of a, a level with the concrete there. So, what is the solution as it stands? Well, uh, we armor it. We simply uh, cover the sediment up with something nice and hard that is able to resist erosion. So, on the left, let's get an wind farm. This scow hole is formed, so we fill it up with bags of sand, cement. Something that's too in all circumstances. We can also add a, a grid. Uh, this, is a, this is a polymer grid. Here we've got a bridge pier, which is a, a pyramid of, of concrete bricks, essentially. And there's even cases where uh, major offshore wind farms have been protected by just old car tires to good effect. There's an awful lot of infrastructure in our seas and rivers. Uh, it's not just the structures themselves, but they have to be connected. So we have um, lots of cabling, of course, associated with energy production, and we have pipelines coming in from oil rigs, for instance. And those need armoring too, because of course, any if either of those breaches, we have a catastrophic situation. So here we have a, 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 a covering a pipeline, and this uh, is something called a concrete mattress, 
which is a flexible concrete structure which is laid on the seabed over pipelines and cables to protect them. And even when we don't have a structure, often we have an important waterway, uh, perhaps some navigation, and we don't want any slope failure or erosion there too, we, and sediment gets in the way. So in these two instances, we basically just added huge amounts of armour, and there's no natural environment left at all. So there are two issues here. One is the economics of this. It's very expensive. And secondly, there are uh, quite significant environmental negatives. Economically, we've got the cost of materials themselves, whether it's uh, the rock or producing concrete in vast quantities, um, fabricating the plastic mats and designing and testing them. There's other things used like geotextiles that we've seen rubber. We've got to transport them as those materials. So um, we've got to get them from the source, um, from whether it's a factory making concrete or from a quarry making rock. And we've got to get that to that marine site once we've got that to port. Just to give an example, um, the, much of the southwest coastline around um, Tynmouth is almond by very, very dense boulders. And those boulders come from Norway. They come from the north of Norway. So they have to be mined and brought all the way across the North Sea before they can be deployed. And of course, this requires some degree of specialist vessels. So we have to design and build these vessels for specific purposes. There has to be a great deal of precision involved. When you're working on the seabed, which might be 10, 20, 30 meters below the sea, you also need calm seas. So you've got that, the, the accumulated cost of designing and using the vessels, all the fuel required, and then you have to have calm seas while you're installing. Environmental costs. Well, clearly, as we develop the blue economy, there's this increasing emphasis on um, we've seen it with marine protection uh, areas and so on. So we're very aware that we are potentially going to damage the seabed as we harness its power. So these are some examples. This is an offshore wind farm where we've got uh, big boulders put at the bottom to protect that erosion. This is a pipeline which has been covered by gravel, um, which is distinctly different from the behavior of the sand around it. This is one of these concrete lattices which cover a pipeline, and, and you can see the cabling infrastructure here. Um, so we are altering the ecosystem because we are immediately replacing that natural sediment, which is that in itself. It, it houses the lowest levels of life in the ocean, uh, and it's the bottom of the food chain. So as soon as we disturb that level of the food chain, we're affecting everything else. So we are modifying habitats and in some cases removing them. There's also the potential for invasive species. Um, there's there's a documented instances, for instance, of these offshore wind farms, which are protected by these boulders. These offered refuge for species to propagate and, and overwinter, and then they will then they will uh, migrate as they as they breed, bringing species across otherwise unnavigable spaces. Clearly, if you're adding plastics and matting, um, they might degrade over time. That uh, causes chemical and physical pollution. And there's an increasing awareness that a lot of these infrastructure projects are now reaching an end of lifespan, and they require removal. There's also a geomorphic response. Well, essentially, we're, we're putting a structure in to protect a structure. Um, so what we find is there's uh, uh, changes to the sediments and flow patterns within the coastline, and not just for locally, but for many kilometers. And in many cases, you get secondary erosion because you're actually adding another structure. So we can find that, uh, particularly in these in these boulder structures here, um, they actually the water propagates through the gaps and causes erosion and undermines the foundation. And lastly, certainly not least, carbon footprint. Um, if we're covering pipelines for tens, if not hundreds of kilometers using these concrete mattresses, for instance, then that is very carbon intensive. And of course, if you're bringing rocks from Norway, that's carbon intensive. And all the shipping is, of course, diesel. So what is the solution? Well, I'm going to propose a solution. I'm going to take a step back now, stop talking about engineering, uh, and go back to sort of uh, natural sediments. And I was involved in a study looking at estuaries. Here is a big, wide mud flat. Equations to describe sediment transport and flow, and some of them didn't work. They just did not work, and we couldn't figure out why. So we tested the theory that maybe it's this biological stickiness. As a sediment guy, you know, it's all about rocks, nothing to do with ecology. Well, that's not true. Um, it modifies the environment considerably. It's not what we have. We have this uh, habitat rich in bacteria and diatoms, and these are the things that um, ultimately uh, eat and then the mussels are then eaten by birds and so on. So it's the bottom of the food chain and they produce biopolymers through their life cycle. And these are sort of sticky long chain carbohydrate 
sometimes known as EPS substances. And if anyone's ever stepped in this mud, it's likely you might have lost your wellies. And that's due to this stickiness, this inherent stickiness. If we zoom in microscopes, these are two images here. On the left, we have this image. This is a sand grain, this gray, gray square structure. And next to it, we've pulled a sand grain out. And what you can see is this socket, which is essentially sort of like, imagine if you pull something that's being glued in and you pull it out, you've got this socket of glue. And it shows this EPS is gluing the, the matrix together. And this image zooming in further, we've got the sand grains, which are linked by this big elastic bridge, a bit like a spider web, connecting these grains. So if you apply a force, a bit like if you, if you put your finger on the top of a jelly, it's very hard to break the surface. And that's because all the force is distributed throughout the, 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 the matrix of this sediment. It's a bit like the, uh, so that distributes the force, making it very, very stable. The good news is we don't have to propagate these bacteria and diatoms in order to get this effect. Uh, these EPS substances are actually produced on an industrial scale. They, they're used in industry. It could be used in uh, the production of paper, in the drilling industry as a lubricant, principally used in uh, food money. To raise an example here, xanthan gum, which is something we used in the study I'm about to describe. This is, you can buy this off the shelf in whole food shops. It's used as a thickening agent. The chewing, chewing gum is from xanthan gum. Okay, so we can buy these things off the shelf, which makes the application quite feasible. So we did a pilot study. Um, we chose offshore wind farms as a case study. Um, why did we do this? There are many structures. Well, clearly offshore wind farms are proliferating at a great rate. Um, there was 37 billion pounds worth of investment in Europe alone last year. 30% of the capital expenditure of an offshore wind farm goes on design, fabrication and installation of foundation because it's obviously critical that it's protected from erosion. So aside from the turbine itself, the single biggest cost-saving measure could be through innovative designs for scale protection. So here's our system we set up in our lab. We've got a, we've got a great laboratory here at Plymouth University where we can fire flows at objects um, and study what happens. So this is a simulation of, of the flow system we were looking at. So this will fly in. The flow is acting from right to left on your screen. And so at the bottom of the wind farm now, we have a nice flat seabed. The flow system develops. We get these vortices acting on the bed. And ultimately, we get a great big scour hole. And that's what we're protecting against. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to now show you the results of the experiments where we started off with our little model of, a, of an offshore wind farm. We started off with pure sand with no additive, which is very mobile. And then we slowly added, we repeated the experiments with Additive, the additive, the EPS additive, but very small quantities. We increase that gradually through each experiment. So this first image is of the sand. So this is after all erosion has, has finished. Uh, the red bounding box shows the original surface of the sand before we started the flow. And the red line on the monitor pile here as well shows the same height. So as, as we cycle through, we can see there's a scout hole around, but even more broadly, the whole sand area has been degraded. It's been lowered. Okay. So this percentage values that I'm showing you on here are the percent by weight um, uh, of, of what's in the sand. So the additive is added in extremely small quantities. So we use about 50 kilograms of sand in each experiment, and we use more, no more than a teaspoonful of the uh, additive mixed throughout the whole of the mass. So we can see as we cycle through, firstly, the, the general surface isn't lowered. Secondly, the scour hole is less deep and it's much smaller in aerial extent. So that means the volume of the sediment is much uh, eroded, that is much lower. So that means that if we were to armor the bed, um, we would need much less armor. And when we get to 0.15% here, we can see that the scour hole is actually less than the diameter of the pole itself. This is the same results, just a, a sliced cross section through the middle. So this is our original sand surface. Here is our sand only with no additive, and I'll just skip this on a bit. So this is our tiny scour hole as we reach the back end. And one thing I didn't show you in the last image is we actually tested a 0.5% to see what would happen. And the answer is nothing happened, nothing moved, no erosion whatsoever. So this suggests that even in a really radical flow environment, when the flow forcing is really strong in a stormy wave environment offshore, we might be able to use perhaps one, two, three percent and still maintain good effects. In terms of cost effectiveness, this is just a back of the envelope calculation based on our experiments. So we scaled everything down from 
This is actually our flume environment. So this, this is a box containing 50 kilograms of sand plus the additive, and this is our monopile. So we might need six, seven, eight grams of the additive. And when we scale it back up to what we originally started with, to our monopile here, the equivalent sand is 3,200 uh, 3, tons of sand, which means we would need four tons of biopolymer. That sounds like an awful lot. But when we buy that in, from a, a commercial level, that's only just over 3,000 pounds, which is a mere fraction of what might be required in terms of hard engineering. In terms of environmental support, well, I've distributed the results of this study to various different organizations to, to uh, get their take on it. And each of these uh, agencies have shown broadly that they're very supportive. Um, they're obviously very focused on protecting habitats and species as we de develop the use of our seas and, and rivers. They obviously develop areas together and look at permitting and licensing within those areas. Um, they're very keen on habitat restoration. They want to development of the seabed and the foreshore. They are, of course, responsible for licensing of any development of, of, of uh, infrastructure, uh, and therefore they are very strict on the regulations of permitting. They want to minimize any uh, destruction of habitats uh, and long-term effects. So they're increasingly looking at a nature-based approach to, to this. I'm gonna, uh, so what are the key issues? We've done a nice pilot study, but there are a few key issues we need to drive this forward. The first is that we've looked at one biopolymer in one scenario. There are many, many, literally hundreds potentially that might be useful. So we can look at each of their effectivenesses, uh, the durability of them, their availability and their cost. We need to then know what concentrations we need for different flow environments. So for different flows and different sediment types and different biopolymer types, we need to establish what concentration is required to prevent erosion. And lastly, durability. These are... Um, so they might dissolve into the flow, they might break down organically, or they might even be consumed because they're potentially a food source. The good news is I've obtained a little bit of funding through University of Plymouth's Solutions Fund. So over the next 18 months, we'll be addressing these through experiments here at Plymouth in conjunction with guidance from HR Wallingford. Once we have the answer to these questions, and I've got to shoehorn the pun in, well, these are the foundations of um, any future work. So we can then move forward we can then look at specific applications so we can look at scenarios a, a, a developer can say i've got i need to build a bridge network rail can say i need to build this bridge uh, it's an environmentally sensitive location we don't want to put concrete in so we've got this flow we've got this sediment type what type of biopolymer do you recommend and what concentration and how long will it last and once we know the the type and concentrations we can then start asking environmental questions. What are the positives and negatives versus traditional methods? So summary, we have a nature-based solution, which is applicable to many erosion scenarios. It's been well received by environmental agencies. Of course, there are there's some key ecological aspects we need to consider. The biopolymer analysis are very low cost and many types available already. We've got a pilot study that proves uh, extremely effective in one scenario. And we've got a little bit of money which allows us to expand this to the next steps. But of course, what I want to do along with HR Wallingford, who are world leaders in this sort of scour protection environment, is ultimately take it to field trials to see if it actually works in the real environment. So we have a, we have a plan. We've got uh, uh, several modules that we want to study in order to bring this forward to a real world solution. And so, of course, we're seeking industrial support at any level to develop this as well. I'll leave you with a final slide. This is uh, one of HR Wallingford's facilities. This is one of their testing beds called the Fast Flow Facility. It's a world leading uh, site and uh, we can ultimately work at one. It's obviously expensive to run, which is why it'd be nice to get some outside investment. And once we've achieved work in this scale, we can then move to working actually on the seabed or riverbed. Uh, questions, comments and suggestions are welcome. And you can always contact me on this email address. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Rob. That's really, really interesting. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of invested in my own research a little bit and understanding about what what biopolymers should be selected, how do we match it to the environments, and and obviously it makes sense uh, in terms of trying to do a job that doesn't create secondary pollution in some way. You know, whether it will be, for, you know, filtering or 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 stabilisation. So, so you know. 
in terms of like matching uh, biopolymers to to environments where's how how much of, uh, have you been thinking about that the issue we have here is that we're not quite sure which biopolymer type we need um so principally we need to make sure it works first so we need to study the biopolymer types and the concentrations and until we have a good handle on that it's perhaps a bit premature to then start thinking uh, more broadly about the environmental effects we it would be nice to one of the work we're doing is, is very much physical at the moment to make sure we have an actual design solution um so once we're through the next stage uh, of work we will have uh, much more focus on uh, the, the broader picture it sounds it sounds um contradictory but by doing some focus work then it will give us the roots to then look at the various implications beyond that mm, yeah i mean it makes me think of you know um, it's, it's sort of marine seawater environments and using biopolymers from you know that already exist in these environments as they may become like a food source so depending if you're in a in a saline environment or freshwater environment it, it would you know there would maybe be, be some obvious answers but we don't know until we do the research there's a question here from christian caruso he says would you think that using biopolymers um has massive impacts that would be experienced by marine species thank you christian uh, it's a very good question and and we're very aware that we uh, we will be modifying an environment um mm -hmm. there are two uh, two simple things here one one of course we as soon as we we are modifying the environment in some degree um much of these substances exist in nature they will vary it's not enough to say they're just biopolymers they will they will be different um but if you imagine that we are trying what the, well ultimately what we'd like to do is use the site sediments that are in existence and mix that with a high concentration of slurry so a sediment that contains the biopolymer already mm. and turn them to the seabed so in that sense we are trying to minimize the disruption there's no doubt that we have to protect the bed if we're going to have these structures in the flow environment but it's still a question of minimizing that and it might be the case but is that a frozen rob <laughs> or is that just me hello can i hear you <laughs> might, be, might be my end sally what do you reckon <laughs> Propagate. So it might mean that we've got this additional food source. So it could be that, that um, we actually are able to rapidly uh, recolonize an environment that's been disturbed through engineering. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's sorry, I missed a little bit of that. But um, Niall Hockey is actually on the line as well. He says, "Is this considered hard or soft engineering?" Which I thought was a quite quite an interesting question because <laughs> you'd think it'd be quite sort of you know. Well, I, I would I would certainly uh, consider this soft engineering because, like I say, we are hopefully. Uh, it is a nature-based solution. So the simple answer there would be soft engineering. Um, yeah. Just seen a question pop up from Anonymous here. Um, just to answer yeah. that, if the biopolymers already exist in the environment, why do they not assist in scale protection naturally? The answer to that is they principally only exist in organic sediments found in rivers and estuaries. Mm -hmm. So if we work in the offshore environment where it's essentially uh, sand with maybe a little bit of clay but very little organics, what we're doing now is we would augment, uh, we would make that, make that sediment sticky. The bit that bit that's going to be eroded, we can make that sticky quite simply. Um, uh, so that that's why we found this process happening in natural substances, and we're now trying to apply it in a place where it doesn't exist in nature, but it's still a natural substance. If that makes sense. Sure, sure. No, that's really. really I think that's answered the question. Well, I think our time has come to an end here. Um, I'd like to thank you, Rob, for presenting today and also to Alistair, who presented before you. Um, really fascinating discussion that can come out of this. And if you'd like to move over to the discussion boards um, to continue this, that would be really great. But thanks again, Rob. And um, thanks for everyone for coming. It's really, really been an interesting morning. I hope you have a good day. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Cheers, Rob. Bye-bye.